what we're talking about is the, the power of meditation to create benefits in society as a whole. And the two techniques we're talking about is transcendental meditation and a more advanced program called TM City Program. There's a lot of talk about meditation. I'm, I'm sure a number of you actually meditate yourselves here, or various versions. And uh, meditation is usually associated with mysticism and beliefs and religion and ideologies. And today I'm going to be talking more about the facts and the research and the science behind it. I'm often asked, especially when I'm talking about TM and things like that, you know, do you believe it or you obviously believe in world peace? No, I don't. I don't believe in it. I just know. And what I'm trying to do this evening is to draw the distinction between belief and knowledge. It's belief or ideology and facts. And if I can draw the analogy of let's say driving a motor car, something as mundane as routine as that, okay. Can I just ask, who here drove to the school this evening? So probably all hands go up, or you were driven <laughs> by somebody else, right? If I asked you, um, are you driving home this evening, how many people then put their hands up? Right. You wouldn't expect me to say, do you believe you're going to go home this evening? Would you? No? You don't say, I believe I'm going home by car. It's not an emotional thing. It's a fact. It's, it's a fact derived from many years, probably, of driving, of getting in and out of cars. When you were children, you got in and out of cars. They seem to work. And although they don't always work, there's a good reason why they might not work. Because it's technology. There are constraints to that technology. So if you don't get home this evening, or if you don't get home on time, let's put it that way, it's because... If there isn't any petrol in the car, or the starting motor has stopped, or, or the battery's down, or something like that, okay. But it's not a question of belief, is it? It's not a wish thing. And that's what I'm going to try and get across today. Meditation and the power of meditation to create world peace is a fact. It's an absolutely proven fact, again and again and again and again. And the terrible thing is that nobody seems to know about it. Least of all the governments, the media ignore it. But it's there for the taking, if only we take up the challenge. Which is why I call it the silent peace movement. Because the silent peace movement is, well, it's not very noisy when we're doing it. <laughs> we're all in silence and it's meditation. But also, it's completely unheard of. People just don't know about it. And what we've got to come up against, is what we do come up against, is something called cognitive dissonance. Has anyone heard that term before? Cognitive dissonance? It's, uh, Simon's heard because I keep on telling him about it. Cognitive dissonance, yeah, some of you here are involved in natural medicine of one sort or another, or yeah. use natural medicine, or are practitioners of natural medicine. Have you ever had the experience of talking to a doctor, especially about any cures you might have experienced in natural medicine? Have you noticed that after a little while of talking, their eyes glaze over? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's just gone. What, what you're doing is you're challenging their belief system, you're challenging their whole identity. They don't believe what you're saying, not because you're a liar or anything like that, they just don't want to hear it. And they just blot it out. It does, the facts don't match the belief. And so therefore, we ignore the facts. Okay? It's much easier to do that and you can get on and live your life. So what we've got to do is challenge people's belief. Okay, and get them to understand that this is fact. I've gone on enough about this. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Okay, and, and just I'm going to touch on this. I am not a scientist. I do not have the uh, intellectual wattage or horsepower to really get into unified field theories. There's probably a quantum scientist in the audience anyway, so I'm a little bit concerned that I go too deep because I'll get challenged and then show, show myself up for being a fool. But what I want to point out is that over perhaps over the last couple of hundred years, science has sort of moved away from the spiritual side of life. It's become separated. Scientists traditionally or typically we, we consider to be perhaps even atheists, but they're, they're very materialistic. But in recent years, perhaps in the last 20 or 30 years, with the sort of onset of quantum physics, it's had a more unifying effect on our general understanding of the universe and stuff generally. Uh, I don't know whether you can read this. Can you see no, the no, top no. line? It's got things like electromagnetism, weak force, strong force, and gravity. So we look at the material universe and it's all made up of molecules, isn't it? Compounds of one sort of molecules. All molecules are made up of atoms. And these are the solid things in nature, okay? And we can touch them, feel them, we know they exist. But of course, some years ago they discovered that actually 
all these atoms are made up of these four particular forces, subatomic particles, which are really energy particles. It's just pure energy. Okay. So we're looking at a universe that, although looks very solid, is actually energy. And then scientists began to try and unify these. They've got it down to three here. They're unifying those two things. Then they went down a, a stage lower. They, they, this is grand unification that allegedly uh, unifies electroweak unification, strong force, and so on and so forth. And what they're doing is they're speculating, calculating, estimating. I don't know quite how you would describe it. But that actually, ultimately, will end up with one unified field. And there are certain properties that you can estimate will be in that unified field. And it, the main property is it's pure intelligence. Now, in objective terms, the objective knowledge, the sort of rational Western scientific view, okay, we can understand the pure intelligence aspect, but also it's self-referral. It understands and is aware of itself. So now we're beginning to slip into consciousness. And there's another blend of knowledge from the East, which, which we call Vedic science, which perhaps abides in the, in the Himalayas and has been there for generations, which talks about self-referral consciousness, transcendental consciousness. This is where transcendental meditation comes from. And what they're saying is that the unified field and transcendental consciousness are the same thing. And this is what you experience when you start to meditate. Can I have the next slide? <coughs> now this particular knowledge comes from this individual here, uh, who's a guru, Swami Brahmananda Saraswati Shankaracharya of Joy to Math. Bit of a mouthful. Very great man, really. He was born in the 19th century, and about the age of 11, he decided that he wanted to live a spiritual life. So he wandered off. <laughs> Nightmare for a parent. But that's what he did. And he spent two or three years looking for a guru found what he considered to be the right guru for him, someone who was without anger was his, his criteria. He then spent the next 60 years in silence. Okay. Now, when I say silence, I don't know whether it was 24 hours 7, but it was definitely in the jungles, in the hills, the hills of the Himalayas, in, in silence. And he became enlightened to a very great extent and became renowned for it in, in, the, in the hills of northern India. Now this tradition of knowledge that I'm talking about, that talks about the sort of self-referral dynamics, the transcendental consciousness, comes down from the Vedic tradition and has been passed down from generation to generation to generation, literally way back before recorded time. Uh, there was a revival of this knowledge uh, about a thousand years ago. A man called Shankara uh, revived the knowledge and he set up certain seats of so sort of administration for this knowledge. And he turned those individuals, a little bit like bishops in, in say, the Church of England or the Roman Catholic Church, he entitled them uh, Shankacharyas. And the lead seat is uh, Joy to Math. So this man was selected or appointed or emerged as the Shankacharya of, of Joy to Math back in uh, 1941, a very significant date, was right in the middle of the <coughs> Second World War. And so, he, in a sense, he's got that authority, that, that authenticity that we would ascribe to, say, the Archbishop of Canterbury or, or, or the Pope, you know, Pope in Rome. Okay. Next slide, please. Now, one of his uh, most devoted pupils was this man here, who you might, might be familiar with, His Holiness Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who's run the TM movement and, and started it up. Now, if you notice, Maharishi wears white robes and... Uh, the Shankacharya wears uh, orange robes. Orange robes because he's a Brahmin in the priest class. Maharishi wasn't in the priest class, so although he's a devoted pupil, when uh, Gurudev, as we call him, passed on, Maharishi was not made the Shankacharya. Gurudev gave him the brief, go out to the world and spread meditation, spread this knowledge to the whole world. And that's what he, <coughs> that's what he decided to do. And when he left the Himalayas, he said, this is a quote, I had one thing in mind, that I know something <coughs> which is useful to every man. This was a complete change in the Vedic tradition. Beforehand, it had been for the cognoscenti, it had been for the few. If you wanted to learn to meditate, you had to go and work on an ashram, find a guru, work for that guru, be devoted to that guru, and when that guru thought you were ready, then he might teach you to meditate. Maharishi changed that. He said, no, this is for everybody. This isn't just for those who want a spiritual life. He turned it around the other way. Spiritual life is a practical life. It's for everybody. 
We've all got human nervous systems. We've all got hearts. We're all connected to God. So that's what he decided to do. Next slide, please. <clears throat> but he had a problem. And this is where the science begins to come in. There's only one of him, and there's uh, five billion of us, or four billion in those days. How is he going to teach millions of people to meditate? So, I thought about this for a while. I think we can go to the next slide. Yes. And what he realised, right, he felt meditation was actually a very practical practice, but it needs to be integrated with the householder's uh, way of thinking, uh, way, way of activity. It needed to be reliable, and it needed to be predictable. And what he set up, was a systemized way of teaching TM. And as a result of which, he was able to teach tens of thousands of TM teachers, teachers of transcendental meditation. We were then able to go across the world and start to teach. And then you're beginning to get, actually, there are about how many? Six million people, you think? Between five and seven. How many? Between five and seven. Five and seven, yeah. So, so it's, it's getting to be millions of people. Okay. <coughs> And this is because we can rely completely on the way the teachers teach. The joke is that you can go to the first step of the teaching course in, in, in London and go the next day to Paris and the third day to Tokyo, another day to New York or Italy, and you'll get the same program. You'll fall in step with whoever's, whoever's teaching you. It's, it's very, very systematic. So it had two advantages. One is he could teach millions of people. The other was, and this is essential for this talk, and I, I need to sort of... Uh, emphasize this a bit, it meant that we could actually research the results, that there was predictability in there. We could say, right, if you do this, this will happen. Isn't that the basis of a good scientific experiment? You've got to be able to predict, predict the answer. And that's what we're able to do, because one of the first things he did, in about 1960, he came out in the late 1950s, and people were learning to meditate because they were stressed, because they, they, they were seekers, and so on and so forth. It was a bit of mystery. He said, look, you're not just doing this for yourself. You are benefiting your community. And even then, he was able to say, if we just get 1% of society to learn to meditate, it will have an impact right the way across society. There's a sudden shift. So, I think the next slide, we're back into the research. And sure enough, by around, there was a surge in teaching. Uh, everyone's heard of the Beatles. And Maharishi was, of course, the Beatles guru for a while. And it made it very, very popular. And there was a surge of teaching of te transcendental meditation in the late 60s and, and 70s. And in America, uh, there were literally hundreds of thousands of people learning at, at that time. And they began to realize that one or two towns in America had actually... Uh, achieve what we call the 1% threshold. It actually got enough people in the town meditating uh, 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 to achieve this effect. And sure enough, they found that the crime rate was going down. Okay, so this inspired the first uh, research study, uh, guys called Ball and, and Landreth. And uh, they chose 100, they chose a sample of 101 towns, random sample in the United States, uh, roughly 25 to 50,000 people in each. And they trawled through them and they found that 11 of these towns, I mean, they're looking at TM statistics, obviously, um, had 1%. And they then looked at the various crime rates. Now, they chose crime rates because they thought it was an indication of social disease or social dis-ease and social well-being. If society is happy, it has a very, very low crime rate. I think we can all accept that. And if it's not happy, the crime rate goes up. And so there were signs that these, these individual um, cities, communities were getting happier. Mm -hmm. Because you look at, uh, I don't know if you can, hopefully you can, but the 1% cities were showing an 8% reduction in crime, as opposed to the control cities, which is over 8% increase in crime. At that time in the States, crime was going up, had been going up for a while. I couldn't show it, I haven't got all the figures, but if you look at the graph, of crime rates for the 101 cities and the 11 cities. They're exactly the same. They parallel one another until about 74 and then they suddenly diverge like that. They just go, go away. One lot goes down, the other lot just carries on and continues. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, a man called Guy Hatchard, he was a TM teacher in, in Cleveland, which has about 40 suburbs. So he thought, well, do we have to wait for the 1% effect? Is anything happening 
beforehand. I won't spend too long on this, but it's, it's important for later on. So he, he basically discovered that at a very low level, we don't seem to be getting any impact. But at about one point, it's, it's uh, 0.39%, actually, he began to notice that uh, in about a dozen different suburbs, they were reaching this sort of figure, you began to get a slight drop off in, in, in crime. Uh, when it got over the 1%, there was a sudden shift. And if you got higher than 1%, you're getting to 2% or something like that, there was a really big, big impressive move. Okay. This quickly led to another study, which they said, well, what's happening over time? And this is important because what we see is that, okay, initially we get a, we get a bit of a change, but it accumulates over time. So here, this was carried out over a five-year period, if I'm right. I would say that. Five and a half year study. Uh, they chose 24 experimental cities. I had 20, 24 cities that had the 1% the effect. And 24 control cities. They matched them for things like age, uh, college uh, um, population, unemployment rates, mean average income, things like that, and geographic area. So they tried to match the towns so that they, they should be getting similar results. Okay? And what they were finding is that over that period, there was a 2% increase in crime in the control towns, that's the towns that weren't meditating, and a 22% drop in crime in the towns that were. Fantastic. Okay, go on then. Any questions so far? No? Nope. All right. It's not too dry. <laughs> okay. Rhode Island study. This is the first what we call prospective study. Now, up until now, it had all been what we call retrospective, i.e. we were looking at the situation as it arose. Well, that's not a very good scientific experiment. So the objection was, yes, but you're just choosing these towns because you know about it. You've got to make a prediction. You've got to set up the experiment, say, when we do this experiment, this is going to happen. So they wanted to uh, try something a little bit more ambitious, uh, a wider area, and also it's not all about crime, is it? They wanted to look at what they call the QOL, uh, quality of life uh, statistics as well. And I think, um, I've got it elsewhere, they looked at things like road accidents and, and other aspects of life, which would indicate, again, social dis-ease. So what they did, they decided on Rhode Island, because it's the smallest state in the United States of America, it's a million people. So they thought that was probably within the capacity of the TM organisation at the time to be able to teach 10,000 people. And they drafted in 300 teachers into uh, Rhode Island and set about frantically teaching people. Before they started, they predicted the results in public. So crime was one, mortality rate, motor vehicle fatalities, auto accident, unemployment pollution, and believe it or not, beer consumption and cigarette <laughs> consumption. I don't know whether that was supposed to go up as these came down or down. But, uh, anyway, they created a composite um, index, which means they added all this up together. I wouldn't know how to do it. I don't pretend to be a statistician. Uh, but the idea is the better the, uh, the situation, the graph should be going up. And this is what happened. Now, what they did find here, this is the first study where the TM City program started to come into play. Now, I, I mentioned TM is a meditation technique. And TM City Program is a, is a more advanced technique, which if you've been doing TM for a while, you can, you can learn and, and do that. It takes a bit more of a commitment in time, to be honest. Um, but it has uh, an even more powerful effect. Now, the organisation was only able to teach 5,000 people in this million pound community. So, sorry, million pound, million people uh, community. So they had only got about half percent. But they did have 300 teachers, and all those teachers were doing the TM City program. And what Murashi predicted was that if you can get the TM City program practitioners to meditate in a group together, you don't need 1% to have an impact on society. You only need the square root of 1%, i.e. a tiny, tiny fraction of the site. So, for instance, in the Bournemouth area, well, it's just, it's just uh, East Dorset, South East Dorset, so Bournemouth, Pool, Christchurch, Wimborne, things like that. We've got about half a million people. Now, that's what do we need. We need 5,000 meditators there. We only need about 80 uh, TM sit ups. Right, so it's a very, very reduced amount. This, this gives a huge extra power and velocity to what we can achieve with meditation. Uh, and this is the result. So the. Um, Quality of life statistics starts off at zero, shot up during the period of the study, and then started going back down again. It didn't go back down to zero again because we did have 5,000 meditators.
hospitals. And as we saw before, if you start getting at least a good community of medical aid going, it starts having an impact on, on society. So it's a very, very important study indeed, and of course, totally ignored by the press. So there we go. Oh, Jamie, yeah. Can I ask you a question? I yeah. You've um, got stress. How long that um, project takes? This particular project, uh, it was a matter of a few months because they had to build up the teachers. So it was quite a, as projects go, it's quite a long one. A lot of them are very short. You see, later on, the World Peace Project was the original one. It was only nine days or something, but they, they we're having to monitor it effect in nine days. But this was quite a, a, a long term, months and months and months. It's very difficult to get to uh, deploy that many people, you know. The team movement isn't made. It's an army. It's not paying people. It's it's lots of individuals doing their own thing, and, and it's there. What tends to attract them to these projects is just pure inspiration. But you can't live off inspiration forever. I mean, they tend to disband after, after all. Aren't they? Okay. So this inspired the first World Peace Project. So they realised that they could have a tiny, tiny, tiny little handful of people and have a real impact on a community. And at the time, we're in the middle of the Cold War, uh, this is the late 1970s, if I remember rightly. Uh, yeah, late, late 1970s, and there were five, there were about 60 trouble spots in the world, actually, uh, at, at that time. Th things were pretty rough. Um, but they chose these five particular areas, and that's literally the number of SIDARs they sent to them. So, uh, in Iran, for instance, uh, at the time, the Shah, you remember him? Uh, he's been kicked out. We've got the Ayatollahs now, which hasn't exactly improved the situation. But at the time, there were lots of riots, lots of mass demonstrations, there were strikes and all the rest of it. Um, it was going through a rough time. Rhodesia was in the middle of a civil war. It's now called Zimbabwe. It was, it was the run-up to independence. Uh, Kampuchea, there was a lot of violence in there. And Thailand, in particular, was being threatened with invasion. It was, it was worried about being invaded. Uh, in Lebanon, there was a very bitter civil war that dragged on for years going on. And Nicaragua, there was a lot of, a lot of trouble there. So they just sent these tiny groups in, okay? And one or two of them, I think, if I remember rightly, the Nicaragua one, they sent in 140, it wasn't enough, so they sent in some more. <laughs> it was literally, you know, they hadn't uh, ramped up the accelerator enough. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So this set the pattern for future interventions, and it's probably why we, we don't do it in long because we, we haven't been able to sustain, I say we, but, you know, TM organisation. There's a before, there's a during, and there's an after. Beforehand, this, this is the same thing happens every time, there's chaos, mayhem, war, violence, whatever it is that's going on, we we'll send the troops in, it all stops. It stops within 24 hours, it just stops dead, you can literally Set your watch by it. As someone says, it's like turning out. It's like turning on the light. Bang! It just just stops overnight. And then after, it all goes back to <laughs> what it was before. So what we find is, if if during the period of the intervention there hasn't been some structured negotiated agreement or something like that, it tends to revert back to what it was. So that just shows the need. These things need to be permanent. Uh, had an example of that in Croatia. It's not a research project, it was one I was on. Uh, Croatia was blowing itself apart. It was getting very, very volatile. Look, it looked like it was getting out of hand. There were all kinds of bad things due to happen, including the defamation of rocket fuel and created a massive pollution problem in, in uh, Southeast Europe. Everyone knows what happened to Bosnia in, in subsequent years. The group started to go in, and as the numbers built up, so the fighting subsided, and on the day that we got the square root of 1% of the Croatian population, the fighting stopped altogether. And it stopped for just enough time for, I think it was Cyrus Vance and, and Lord Carrington, people like that, were able to negotiate some sort of settlement. And Croatia's independence became recognised, first by Germany, then the European Union, and the others followed. And after that, if there was going to be more fighting, it was going to be international war. And that completely changed the, the dynamics of the situation. So although when we left, fighting resumed, it resumed a much, much milder and then petered out, petered out altogether. Okay, right. So the first World Peace Project, what they monitored from this, although we hadn't got the square root of 1% of the whole world population, what they reckoned was that because they were focusing on hotspots around the world that were 
were very high profile hotspots at the time, it would have an impact generally. Incidentally, these statistics are drawn from independent sources. They're not the TM organisation massaging figures to suit, suit the circumstances. This is just drawn, and in this case, it came from the Conflict and Peace Data Bank. And as you can see, uh, they're looking at hostile acts, verbal, verbal hostilities, cooperative events, and you'll see the hostile acts go down, verbal hostilities get, go down, go up slightly in that one, and cooperative events uh, go up, okay, for international affairs. So the, the, the other chart was about domestic, so it was what's happening in those particular uh, countries, and this is happening across the globe. Hostile acts down, verbal hostilities down, cooperative events up. Okay, next slide. Rhodesia had a particularly impressive uh, impact. Uh, in September, there was about 33 people being killed every day on average. It was a bit of a surge in it. But they chose as the baseline a period um, <coughs> between September and the actual intervention, which was like November, December time. <coughs> and the peace group came in and it dropped down from you know, 15 people a day being killed down to about three or four. So it was quite a quite a big change, and it lasted several weeks. Elsewhere, uh, Nicaragua, violence and tension subside, suspension of military rule, unconditional amnesty to political prisoners, censorship removed, plebiscite promised on President Somoza. He, he actually promised he would have a plebiscite on his own presidential rule, which of course he reneged on immediately <laughs> the group left. So things were just beginning to normalise as a result of the group being there. Okay, next one. Iran, demonstrations became peaceful as opposed to be violent, strikes dissipated, the oil taps got turned on again, which was a relief to everybody, colleges had opened, and 477 political prisoners were released. Of course, obviously, we left. The reason why we left in that particular case, the Shah's government refused to renew people's visas. The visas started running out, so the Siddars began to leave. And when the numbers went, started going down below the square root of 1% effect, Marashi pulled them all out. And literally, the whole thing erupted <coughs> almost immediately after their departure. It was really quite a contrast between during and after. And the Shah's government collapsed about two weeks later, and the Ayatollah was to go. Okay. How long did they meditate on, in, in these periods? Sorry? How long did they meditate? I, to be honest, I can't long? remember. Uh, this half a day, this half was. Half hour, oh, how long did the individual meditate? Yeah, they, 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 yeah uh, when you do a project like this, <laughs> well, there's nothing else to do. <laughs> so uh, you meditate all day. <laughs> you meditate all day. It's, it's very interesting, you know. I've been places all over the world. Oh, have you seen the, you know, Taj Mahal? <laughs> Where is it? No. <laughs> no. Go out there and you just don't see it. Or go to Washington and say, Oh, did you see Vietnam and more? Isn't it impressive? Or the White House? I mean, sorry, I didn't, didn't see it. You know, just that, that's what you do. That's what you're there for. And actually, if, if, if the situation is dangerous, you can't wait to get out. Because once people, you know that you're being protected when you're there. I, I, I say I haven't. This goes back to what I was saying about belief and knowledge. You know, you know you're safe in your car as long as you drive at a certain speed and don't go mad and don't drink and things like that. You know, there are constraints, but you know you're safe. I know I'm safe in a group. If the group leaves and leaves me behind, I know I'm not. So I want to get, I don't know, leave, leave with them. Uh, and you do get, <laughs> don't get left behind. <laughs> All right. Oh, Lebanon. There was a unique period of continuous calm. Uh, calm. This went on for about three months uh, of the project. Up until then, they had had a number of sort of peace settlements and truces and things like that, and they'd last about 24 hours, and then they'd shoot and start up again. Uh, refugees started returning. Uh, there was a new security plan being negotiated. But as I say being negotiated, both sides seemed to be getting somewhere. And reconstruction was underway, and it all came to an end, I'm afraid, when the group left. Uh, Campuchia, the conflict in Campuchia su subsided during the period and anticipated escalation in time and failed to materialise. You know, it's the usual thing that the violence sort of spills over the borders and what happens you start getting violence in, in the neighbouring country and then the other army moves in to your trick as well. Okay, so that was the first World Peace, this was the first USA super radius. So this was looking at super radius, that's the square root of 1% for the entire United States of America. And this was uh, 1979. They need, or needed, about 1,700 uh, TM SIDARs for this particular project. They got about 2,500. It was located in a place called Amherst, Massachusetts. 
and it lasted for six weeks, and this is the effect. So they saw violent crime come down across the country, uh, fatal car crashes, fatal accidents, and air traffic fatalities, huge jump jump there. Uh, Holland Super Radiant study, there were three studies, two were Dutch groups, Holland's a reasonably small country so we're talking about just a few hundred people, but the, I think the December 81 group, if I remember rightly, was a German group, they, they had a large project going on there, or a large course going on there, and it was large enough to cover the, the Super Radiant's effect for both Germany and Holland at the same time, and so it had the um, desired effect. And this was the first example of sort of spilling over the other side. It happened in the States and, and Canada, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Oh, sorry, what was the first one? The other one was crime, was it? And this one's injurious. So why is the one in Holland much better result than in the States? Because they have more people? Yeah. Like better think, ratio with students? I think um, what we're talking about is stress in the collective consciousness. And I think Holland is just less stressed than the United States of America. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I say that, that later on we'll talk about the Washington course. And, uh, I ha we have to sort of change the rules like, for Washington because it's a very stressed town, so I'll tell you about that later. But yeah, I think that's all it is. And I, it's, it's, although it's a science, you know, there are lots of things going on. It's a very small country, isn't it? And if you had... I, I can't remember what the figures were. I should have perhaps checked beforehand, but let's say you doubled your super radius effect, you're going to get a much bigger impact than 2,500 people spread across you know, the size of the United States of America. It's just as simple as that. All right. Ah, I love this one. Right. This is uh, what we call a prospective study, again. This is during the Lebanese Civil War. This goes back to the 1% effect, actually, and two TM teachers. Was this Dr. Nader? He was, he was the teacher, was he? Yeah, he's also the research scientist here. So this, this is absolutely brilliant. They decided, right, we're going to go into a village that's right in the middle of the, the, the war zone. So there was a lot going on there. It was strategically sort of located right bang in the middle, so both sides were fighting over it. And progressively, it took him a year, uh, which imagine must have been quite dangerous to do. He must have been backwards and forwards. I don't know if he was living there or, or um, just travelling in and out. He's, he is Lebanese. The village uh, comprised about 10,000 people, and so they know that they need to teach about 100 people. It took him a year to do it, but when he did it, the wall deaths just went to complete zero straight away. And it stayed like that for five and a half years. Well, it stayed like that for the rest of the war. And that chart actually shows the, uh, they did a conflict index, you know, what the and the like. So they, they monitored incoming shells, property damage, and casualties, and made a composite index of that. And the blue line you see there is what happened in, in Baskinta. It went from the index from 3.9 down to zero. And in the control villages, they, they looked at, I think, uh, four other villages uh, over the five and a half year period, and it continues to go up. Absolute classic case of what we can achieve when we get 1% of a community meditating. And let's say it accumulates over time. It gradually just, it's like draining the stress out of the system. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is another great one as well. This was a perspective, so they decided, right, we'll try and influence Lebanon from another country. It's very difficult. You can't really put a group into a, a foreign country unless you've got permission. If you haven't got permission, it's very difficult to get in there. When we went into Croatia, we actually got permission. Somebody actually asked us to go there. It wasn't quite who we thought <laughs> was asking, I have to say. It turned out to be the Chamber of Commerce rather than the local government, but um, we were there anyway. <laughs> the fucking stops, so that was great. So, this was in 1983. It went on all summer, and there were a number of resident TM Siddars in Jerusalem. So, what they tried to do is attract them together and get them to meditate on a daily basis together. They needed 65 Siddars to impact Jerusalem, 122 to impact the whole of Israel, and 197 to impact both Israel and Lebanon. And that's what they were actually aiming for. But unfortunately, it sort of worked, and it half worked in the sense that you know, sometimes they had a lot of people in, in, in the program, <coughs> and sometimes they didn't. But have a look at the chart. I think that's next. Oh, right, okay. Uh, these are the composite index that they checked. War intensity in Lebanon, there was a 76% reduction in war deaths when they reached their square root of 1% for the Lebanon, uh, Lebanon country. Uh, newspaper content, they monitored. Again, they get independent analysts to monitor the newspapers for positive and negative news. Tel Aviv stock market, car accidents and fire incidents. Okay, next slide. 
And that's the chart. You can see the blue. Can you see the blue line as opposed to the green line? Yep. Are you able to see that? Yeah. Yep. Okay. You see how the lines more or less match. Well, one is the number of people in the meditation room. Okay. And the other is the composite index. And you'll notice that when there are more people in the room, the index goes up. And when there's less people in the room, it goes down. And it's right, that itself is a fascinating study. It really does mirror exactly what's happening in the program. And it's what we experience when we're doing it together. Okay? Ah, World Peace Project. So this is the first time. So these, these studies were sort of building up momentum. Uh, there are a lot more studies, by the way. There are about 50 studies altogether. I, what I've done is I've tried to choose one which I think creates sort of benchmarks along the way. And the just a couple of previous ones, you know, we're showing that we can do square root of 1% uh, really does have an impact. So the big question is, what can we do for the whole world? But we needed, at the time, about 7,000, 7 to 8,000. And we got 8,000 TM SIDARs together. Uh, the location was in... Fairfield, Iowa. I keep on saying we, but I wasn't there, so I shouldn't, <laughs> shouldn't be saying that. It was a three-week project, but actually there was only nine days of global super radiance, okay? So there was only nine days that we actually had uh, enough people in the room. And so they started monitoring different things around the world, okay? And one of the things they looked at, they think, right, it should be having an effect on Lebanon. If this theory works, we should be having an effect. So Lebanese conflict three weeks prior to the World Peace Project, what they did was they looked at the period before, they looked at the period during, and they looked at the period after. And if you'll see that the two big pieces of the cake there are negative events and strongly negative events. And between the two of them, they come up to about 85%. So 85% of the news content was negative, or the events were, were negative. Okay, next slide. This is during. It shifts, and we now go down to less than we get 43% yeah, negative, and these slices get a lot bigger. Strongly positive events and positive events equal about 50, 53%. Okay. So there's a nice change. And this is an effect radiated from Iowa in the Midwest of the United States of America to the Middle East. Okay, absolutely fantastic. Okay, and afterwards, unfortunately, that's we go back to square one again. Fifty-two percent plus twenty-three percent. We're back up to about eighty percent negative events again. All right. <clears throat> uh, they checked crime reduction in three continents during this this particular study. Washington only down four percent, which we can talk about later. Uh, Karachi and Pakistan down sixteen percent. Victoria, 13%. What they wanted to do was try different continents, and they also needed to match statistics, so they had to get um, uh, local authorities or police authorities or whatever to give them the right statistics. And, and it, they were using something called time series analysis. And what that means is you, you look at all the past data, and you look at the data after the event as well, and you make a prediction that under normal circumstances, what should be happening during the uh, experimental period. Okay, and So you then look at what actually happened, and you match the two, and that's where you get these minus figures from. Okay. Do, do you understand what I'm saying there? So obviously, because you don't know what was happening there, apart from the statistics you got, so uh, you, you try and make a prediction. Okay. Reduction in road traffic fatalities during World Peace Project, again, uh, USA, Australia, and this time South Africa, where they could get the right results. Big drop in the USA for some reason. Australia, 11%, and what's that, 20% in South Africa? All right. The World Stock Index rose by 4.5%. 19 out of 20 stock markets rose by over 1%, all simultaneously. Apparently, that's the probability of that happening is uh, very, very small. Um, I'm not a... Uh, stop watchers, so I don't, I don't know, but um, the fact that all of them can be going up at the same time is just almost unprecedented. 50% okay. reduction in air traffic fatalities, 32% fewer notifiable diseases in the USA, and 17% in Australia. So it's across the board, all, all over the place. Now, obviously, these are only potted statistics or social indicators, they call them, but it's because the resources aren't there to do a comprehensive, you know, you look at the whole planet, we could probably give you a more comprehensive picture. But, Yes, sorry, there's been. I'm, I'm intrigued why you measure air traffic fatality. Because there is not a very, I mean, road traffic fatality is happening all the time. But air traffic fatality seems to be a very 
Do you know, yeah, yeah. It disturbs me that we're getting that many fatalities that we can even do a graph on it. And I think that's why it's such a high figure, actually, because it's obviously a very volatile map. So if you get a shift in coherence and collective consciousness, you know, nothing goes wrong. Um, but you only have to get a little bit out. One plane goes down, you lose a lot of people. So, um, but it's probably not a very good um, indicator to use as a, as a measure. It's one that one they could be able to get hold of. All right. Oh, uh, increased patent applications. Uh, one thing that we should predict as uh, stress leaves the collective consciousness, people should be feeling a little bit more creative, a little bit more enterprising, and this would be reflected in patent applications. So they had a look at that, and sure enough, uh, those have gone up. Uh, don't know what's happening in Australia. It's probably about that. Extra beer consumption was 33%. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, I love this one. Only because of the name. Oakland's Misery Index. Okay. So, um, back in the 70s, I don't know if any of you are old enough uh, for this, but there was something called stagflation. Do you remember that? It was the problem. The problem was that, uh, or the old problem they had beforehand was you either had high unemployment or you had inflation. It was always a balancing two. And then suddenly in the sort of late 60s, yeah, the 60s and 70s, you got both at the same time. You had high unemployment and high inflation. And so Chuck called Oaken <laughs> developed this misery index, which was basically just adding the two together, you know, the percentage points together. And the Oaken's misery index in the United States of America had just been going up and up and up and up and up and up for donkey shares for about 20 years, I think. Okay, so in 19... 80, that should read, it was at 24.5%. I think it's a straightforward addition of unemployment and inflation rate. Now, what happened in the US in the early 80s was the United States managed to get a super ratings group for about eight years, for that, for that entire period. And if you remember what happened during the 80s, uh, America surged ahead, you know, the Cold War and the rest of it, and that, uh, the culmination of that was the collapse of the Soviet Union. America just got stronger and stronger and stronger and richer and richer and richer. And we believe this is the underlying factor behind that. And one of these a bit of evidence is Oaken's Misery Index. What we saw it was that it's just a straightforward decline over that period from 24% to 10.9%. Okay. This was a, a study. It said the, the United States had super radiance for that eight-year period. Sometimes they had enough people for, the, for Canada as well. Okay, so just went over, and so this study just looked at those individual times where there was a spike in the number of people in the program room in, in, in Iowa and see what was happening. And we got this effect here. And they checked for violent fatalities, cigarette consumption, and industrial strikes. And as we see, they're all coming down. Okay, this is a, a very useful study, and it, it, it illustrates the power of super radiance to create world peace. Or as you expand the group, so you're literally gobbling up more and more territory, as it were, and helping more and more communities. To be able to get super radiance for, for the United States, we need 1,767 people. To do Canada on its own, we need 500. Okay. But to do USA and Canada together, we only need 1,862 people. So we only need an extra 95 on top of the United States of America to be able to cover the whole of Canada as well. Canada's a big country. It's got 30 million people in it. We only need 95 people to, to improve Canada. This is getting into number crunching now. There were a number of projects. Uh, they're really courses, actually. There were courses set up to attract siddhas to enjoy, you know, long meditations over sort of several weeks. And they were held in these various places, uh, with uh, the exception of Lebanon. I think that was more of a serious project to try and help things. Um, but they, so they're just monitoring the effect that was having on Lebanon. Because these particular courses created super radiance for the Lebanon. So you see there are three world peace projects here uh, with 7,000 people. So it should, should have a sort of impact. The Bumana Lebanon one is just a local one. So you only need a few siddars. Israel, next door country. So to be able to impact Lebanon, you've got to, you've got to impact the whole of Israel. And then you spill over to Lebanon. Porridge in Yugoslavia was a big course, but it's in that region, and two and a half thousand was enough to cover the, the, the collective consciousness for the whole, whole of that region. And it was shown that each project had a positive impact in its own right. Uh, the probability factor of all seven results being connected is that improbable figure there, so we're talking billions, really, chance of one in a billion. 
to, uh, for this to happen as, as a coincidence. Um, it, they're monitoring over 820 days, so just two and a half years, of which 93 intervention days, 93 days when SIDARs were in place. So it's, it can be very, very precisely measured. Next, next, next slide, thanks. And this was the combined results of all those seven different projects. As you can see, cooperation up 66% during those 83 days, conflict down 47%. War deaths, war fatalities, is that? Or war injuries? War fatalities and then war injuries. Yeah. All right. So it was really having a powerful effect. Again, every time a super agents group was in place, and of course things went back to normal, in inverted commas, uh, when, they, when they departed. Okay. Three global super agents groups, they monitored these as well. Um, sorry, I'm going on a bit. I, I know, so I hope, you're, <laughs> hope you're up there with me. Between 83 and 85, they looked at right what's happening around the world every time we have one of these these uh, peace groups going. They found that terrorism, ter injuries due to terrorist activities, dropped by 72 percent during these during these peace projects. It's only very relevant today because, of course, we've got the global war against terrorism, which is sucking in monstrous amounts of. Uh, energy and money into arms and equipment and, and clamping down on everyone's freedom and fight terrorism, but actually all we need is a group of 8,000 people tucked away somewhere, uh, minding their own business, meditating quite happily on their own, and it'll just evaporate. Okay. Don't forget, these groups are only there for a, literally a few weeks. If, they, if, if it was in place for a permanent period of time, then the effect would accumulate. Okay. Right? Okay. And this is the effect on uh, international conflict of the three groups. There was one in Iowa, one in Hague, and one in Washington. We're going down, what, 35%, 25%, and, and uh, 35%. Huge impact across the globe. And it's literally for only a few days at a time. So, all this culminated in the Washington demonstration. I, I mentioned earlier, you might not have picked up on it, but <clears throat> we talk about the square root of 1%. But it's got to be like a, a cohesive community that you're in. And if you go to a town like Washington, okay, what is the collective consciousness of Washington? It's so interrelated with, first of all, it's, it's, it's the capital of the United States of America, so it's linked with all that. But America's tentacles are all over the world, okay? Both financially, politically, militarily. I think they're intervening in about 55 different countries at the moment, covert operations. It's huge input. And that will be reflected in the collective consciousness of, of, of Washington. They've also got a, a very sad history. I don't know whether you know, Washington was like a trading depot for the slave trade. And when Lincoln banned the slave trade, finally, there were literally tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of Negro slaves in the Washington area with nowhere to go, no jobs, no nothing. And basically the, their descendants are still there. Okay. Uh, so if you go to Washington, the tourist part of Washington, it's gleaming, it's white, it's impressive, it's beautiful architecture. But you go on the outskirts, it's shanty towns. It looks more like South Africa, to be honest. It's dreadful. And the crime rate, I think it's uh, three and a half times more than the national average in Washington. It's, de it's desperate. It really is bad. Uh, this particular course I, I went on... And I remember, you know, you're sitting in the room meditating, and all you can hear, you know, every few minutes is some bloody siren going. Helicopters everywhere. It's like you're in some war zone, you know. It goes on and on and on. I'd, I'd been there uh, several weeks, and I, I sort of came to at some point, thought, something's missing, you know. And what happened was, there was not, not a siren. The sirens had stopped. <laughs> it just finished. But... This project is a demonstration of how sometimes you really have to pack the numbers in. And um, <clears throat> the square root of 1% of Washington is about 400 or something. Like that. And we had 4,000 TM SIDARs there. And actually, when the first group arrived, the, the murder rate actually went up for, for the first week. It, it did, just didn't have the effect. So just more people were coming and coming and coming. And, and actually, when they, um, uh, at the peak, I think it was about 4,000. And we managed to get it down 25%. This was a prospective study. Uh, the prediction was made that we would reduce crime by 20% while we were there. And the chief constable of the area said the only way you can do that is you get 20 inches of snow. 
<laughs> and it was one of the hottest summers we'd, we'd known then. And, and it really did have a, an amazing effect. I had a personal experience with Anna's father shared this as well, actually, completely independently of me. Uh, when I arrived um, at the airport, you know, got a taxi. It was a brilliant, beautiful Lincoln, driven by a Pakistani guy. When he heard where I wanted to go, he rang his mates, and his mate joined him, and, and they, had to, they had, you know, his mate went shotgun. There was two, two of them in the front. And I asked him why. He said, because the area is too rough. We, we would never go there on our own. We always take a, uh, somebody in the cab with us. So uh, he gave me his card. He's a good American businessman. And um, at the end of the course, when I left, I rang him up and got a lift. And uh, he drove up and I said, you're on your own. He said, where's your mate? He said, don't see you need him. He said, so that was it. He just, just felt safer driving around town. And this was downtown, downtown Washington. So you actually do feel it in the atmosphere. It's, it's quite wonderful. Okay. And now, back home at last, um, we have run a, a long-term project in, uh, near Liverpool, a place called Skelmsdale. There was a, uh, is a group up there, but at, at one point, uh, the group was large enough to cope with the whole of the Merseyside, which is about 600,000 people. And this is a, a, a demonstration of the accumulative effect. Liverpool, I don't know whether you remember, but it, it had a reputation for being a bit of, sort of you know, criminal capital of, of, uh, of Great Britain. It was top of the league, I believe, outside London for the crime rate uh, at, at the time. And then the SIDARs hit their super radiance level in 1988. And gradually the crime came down, but it continued to go down. Whereas everywhere else in the country, it was going up. So the metropolitan districts were shooting up and national crime trend was shooting up. By the time we got to 1993, uh, crime had come down about 50% as opposed to what was going on elsewhere in the country. And it's a beautiful example of you just get, can maintain a group in place for a long period of time. It really does have a fantastic effect. And Liverpool's been transformed as a result. So is Scumsdale. Scumsdale was uh, a new town, overspill, they were clearing out the old slums and council houses and things like that in Liverpool and just dumping people in Skelmsdale. It had a shocking unemployment, I can't remember what it was, about 20-30% or something like this. Um, there, was, there was thousands of, I think it was a million square feet of uh, empty industrial space. By, by the late 80s, there was no industrial space available. If you wanted to rent a factory, you couldn't get one. The unemployment was down to sort of, you know, tiny figures and the crime rate had come right, right down, as was matched by insurance company figures. The insurance premiums were very, very low, so it's something to bear in mind as well. Okay, all right. So, um, I started this off with a little bit about knowledge and belief, and I hope I've got it you know, across to you that this isn't about belief, this is about actual facts and knowledge. And this is a test. I know we're all Steiner School parents or, or friends of the Steiner School, we don't do exams and tests, but this is a test. <laughs> This is a graph, all right, of uh, Cambodia. Uh, Cambodia's inflation rate, it was experiencing hyperinflation. And at some point, the super radiance group went into the country, and I would like you to tell me which year you think that happened. <laughs> it is not a trick question. Yeah. Go on, any, any offers, please? <laughs> Sorry? 94. Yeah, 94. It was actually in 93. Completely changed. Cambodia was wrecked, absolutely wrecked. Um, we have very few figures about what was happening beforehand because the, the place was just so chaotic. Um, but one of the figures we did have from exchange rates and things like that was the inflation rate. And so um, Guy Hatchard did this particular survey, and so he was able to monitor inflation rate, and uh, that's what happened. It was, it was it. So something to bear in mind. Uh, this was part of a study he did on Norway and New Zealand that had the 1% effect and, uh, for a number of years. And what he found there was both countries experienced something like a 4% increase in gross domestic product on an annual basis. 5%, five, five yeah, 5%. 20% over five years. Something we need desperately now. And it's just because we had this 1% effect in those two countries. Okay, all right. So... The purpose of what I'm doing with the World Peace Group is I would love to see a local group. Okay? Why can't we have one in the Dorset area? And what I predict is 
that if, if we could get a group, say that's about 50, 80, uh, sorry, 80 to 100 individuals doing the TM City programme in the area, we would see something like 2,250 less crimes, that would be a drop of 5%, that's on a per annum basis. Crime incident in this area is actually going down, so we would have to accelerate that. Okay? That would save, apparently, £9 million, but I don't believe Home Office figures, I cannot believe that that number of crimes would cost that little, I think it's a huge amount. 408 less traffic casualties, that's a 20% drop, I think that would probably happen, and £360 billion increase in local gross domestic product. That's a huge amount for, I'm guessing, a, a tiny cost of hiring people to meditate and work together. On a, on, a, on a permanent basis. It's a vision I have, it's a desire I have. Well, <laughs> I'll leave it with you. Next slide, please. Okay. So, can I just ask you now do you disbelieve <laughs> what I've been saying, or do you believe, or are you getting to the point where you actually know this is the truth? Anyone like to say? I trust you, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the right answer. <laughs> Sorry, I think that's more that bit there, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's fact. Well, you trust your car, I suppose. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll run with that. I'll run with that. I think the next one. Okay. If you'd like to help, which I hope you will, please tell people about this. Go on our website, worldpeacegroup.org. Press like on Facebook, and I'm, I'm on Twitter and like that, but Facebook, if you could share it with your friends, please. If you feel this talk is lively enough and interesting enough, if you know somebody else who, or another group that might like to hear me talk about it, by all means, let me know, please. Uh, I'd love to have a go. That's, that's one way you can help. Help raise some money. It is a fundraising website. We're trying to collect money for uh, groups. If it doesn't go to the local group, we'll go to, well, probably go to India, because we're building a large group out there. And, well, the other thing you do is, of course, why not learn to meditate yourself? You will thoroughly enjoy it, and of course you benefit from the whole community. Should we? Um... Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. <laughs> You're obviously very attentive.